I was actually hoping to make this video on my Facebook Live, but in the last two weeks, every time I go live on Facebook and seemingly with supposedly controversial content, it seems that that's when Facebook algorithms somehow, for some reason, I'll call it Facebook algorithms because all my other social media platforms seem to work fine, but the Facebook algorithms, for some reason, constantly want to reconnect and tell me my, that my signal is not strong, which is not true because my signal is quite strong. I was watching a speech given by Elias Monache. I think that's how you pronounce his surname, Elias Monache, who is the president of the Black Business Council, the BBC. They had a college dinner at Gallagher Convention Center, Gallagher Estate, uh, last month, uh, where they invited President Cyril Ramaphosa to come and be a keynote speaker. I think a table was going for 30,000 rand there, which means it was for the elite. Of course, black and other business people were invited there. Gave a very interesting speech, and I was surprised that he gave the speech there, especially as the president of the Black Business Council, which, of which some of the members have benefited from government. Uh, some of their ex-leaders, they are still in bed with government, and big business in particular. So I don't know if it's because maybe he is still singing for his supper, hoping to gain attention, or if he was genuinely being honest about the fact that our current government um, seems to be fighting against transformation and President Cyril Ramaphosa himself probably needs to go home if he's not going to push for the transformation of the economy now that South Africans have political freedom. Very interesting speech. I'm going to try and download it and upload it on my social media platforms as well. That speech inspired me to make this video this morning and this video is generally to highlight two very important things. The first one is that business is war. I've said this before and I, I'm happy that Elias um, re-emphasized this point. Business is war. It's not a friendly competition, as some of you may think. Business is war. In the world, um, people have always fought over land. People have always fought for political power. People have always fought for minerals. People have fought for in business, for money. And people, obviously, I believe, are constantly fighting for the mind of the masses. For me, that is the ultimate battle that they want to win. So the first important thing is that business is war. The second important thing is that the world is run by gangs. The world has always been run by gangs and it is still run by gangs. And what's important for you to understand is that at any time when you see fighting, it's normally gangs at the top that are fighting and you might find yourself being collateral damage. And you also might find that some of these gangs will recruit you to fight on their behalf. And yet you won't benefit anything. I remember there was a quote um, that I once saw that said something like, when it comes to political leaders, they call your children when it's time to march in the streets and to fight and die. Yet they call their children when it is time to reap business rewards. And that's fundamentally true. They'll always expect you to be marching in the streets, to be getting angry, to be protesting. Even when there's wars, it's you that they send. But when the spoils of the outcomes come, it is not you that they give them to. They give them to their own children, not to you and your children. We're currently in South Africa dealing with uh, strained load shedding. Load shedding in this country is actually 15 years old. Uh, president Tabum Begi, when he was president, was given a report that demanded that more power stations be uh, built. Tabum Begi and his then Deputy President Jacob Zuma decided to not listen to the report and they did not budget for building additional power stations. And that's where our problem started. After he left office or just before he left office, load shedding kicked in, I think, late 2007, 2008. And we are now 15th year now of load shedding. ESCOM was built, I think, over or close to 100 years ago. It was commissioned by the state at the time. Hendrik van der Beel, an engineer, was put as the chairman. And their objective in building ESCOM was to say, we will supply electricity to our citizens at cost. No profit, at cost, number one. And number two, ESCOM would not be taxed. This will ensure that the residents, and more importantly, the economy and industrialization and the mines, have got as close to free as possible edu uh, uh, energy so that we can build a strong economy. Over the years, don't know, 19 something, uh, one of the accountants at the time stole some money. I think the equivalent in 2018 of 
164 million rand. There was a scandal there. Anyways, to cut a long story short, you can check the history of ESCOM online. Tabombegi didn't agree because at the time, Tabombegi and the people there wanted to privatize ESCOM. They never got a chance to. However, what they did win is they got to give government a bigger power or bigger say in how ESCOM is being run. Fast forward to today, President Jacob Zuma at some point appointed Brian Mulife and Matsila Koko to run ESCOM and they helped stop load shedding for a while while they were there. While he was there as well, uh, his business, I'll call them business associates because they linked to him and his son, the Guptas, managed to get access to a mine that was supplying coal to ESCOM. Minority stake, I think 4% of the coal that ESCOM needed, but they managed to get in there. Became a huge scandal. We had the Zondo Commission for state capture, which was meant to see if Jacob Zuma was indeed captured by, by the Guptas and other people as well. Two billion rand spent, of course, no conclusive evidence that Jacob Zuma was captured. And here we are again as the masses being clowns. ESCOM as a state-owned enterprise falls under the ministry of Praveen Kordan. Praveen, this Indian chap, seems to be untouchable whenever he makes mistake, unla mistakes. Unlike other ministers, he seems to not catch the same kind of attacks. And he seems to be protected by the media. In the same breath, Andre Tareta, the current CEO of ESCOM, is not getting lashed as badly as other CEOs of failing SOEs. There are no probes there, even though corruption has been uncovered, even under Andre Tareta's watch. Which is a reminder that we are run by gangs. Cyril Ramaphosa, under his company Shanduga, uh, in partnership with Glencore, was supplying coal to ESCOM. A big chunk of coal, I'm not sure of the percentage. Uh, at an inflated price, he put his brother-in-law, Jeff Khadebe, as a minister in the presidency. His brother-in-law was given the right to oversee independent power producers, understanding or deciding as government that ESCOM clearly can't provide electricity or enough supply. So they will allow private businesses to supply. And they gave them the licenses. 25 licenses were issued by Jeff Khadebe. And for a couple of years, he refused to state who he had given these licenses to. It comes out last year that 12 of the 25 licenses are linked to their joint brother-in-law, Patrice Mutsipe. Family affair, nepotism. Cyril Ramaphosa very conveniently was handpicked by a minority of wealth in the country before South Africa became a democratic nation. He was, I believe, a lawyer at the time. He was funded and backed to set up a trade union. He was requested to set up a trade union. Uh, the National Union of, of Mine Workers. And he was one of the people that led the largest strike uh, in, in, in the mining or even in the economy in this country. Fast forward, he becomes one of the chief negotiators um, at CODESA with Rolf Mayer, deciding on the future of this country and trying to find some way to create a rainbow nation so that black people who had fought and died in the struggle don't outright dominate this country and this economy. As echoed in the words of Nelson Mandela saying, um, he has fought against white domination and black domination, even though we've never had black domination. And he says he doesn't want that, meaning that in his speech, he was saying that white people also have a part to play and black people shouldn't outright dominate the country or the economy. So Cyril made sure of that. After that, he was one of the people that was involved in drafting the constitution, which was meant to be a graduation of the Freedom Charter. Unfortunately, the Freedom Charter has been changed over time just as echoed in the book uh, Animal Farm by George Orwell, where they themselves had some kind of a, uh, a view and a vision for what they wanted for the farm. And over time, it changed. He was involved in the drafting of the constitution, which is touted as one of the best constitutions in the world. And conveniently, he was also made the chair of the BEE, Black Economic Empowerment Commission, where, as we know now, historically, himself, some of his family members, some of his in-laws, uh, some of his friends have become some of the biggest beneficiaries of that same thing that he presided over. Today, President Cyril Ramaphosa is one of the people that is behind trying to scrap black economic empowerment as a requirement for tenders or procurement for government. He's also gone on a platform to say that government is not responsible for creating jobs, which was really a punch in the face for so many black people, and in particular, so many black entrepreneurs. For those of you who may not know, Government has one of the biggest budgets in the country. 
I think over 2 trillion rand every year is under the state. And that 2 trillion rand is given out through tenders. Those tenders today, in the past, under this democratic South Africa, have been given to largely white businesses. Whether it's the construction of, uh, construction of bridges, the construction of roads, whether it is building hospitals. Sometimes they will get a front, they will give the tender to a black man, but that black man will still outsource to a white company. If he is not outsourcing to a white company, black people don't have the equipment. It's very expensive. It's quite technical. They do not have the equipment or the skills needed to build some of this infrastructure. So it goes back again to the same white people. Kudos to the Indian community that seems to be putting its hand up and they're trying to become proper business players in this country where they have their own equipment, their own skills, etc. Even during apartheid days, the biggest businesses were built off the back of government spending, tenders, in one way or another. And yet Cyril has the audacity to say that government cannot create jobs. On top of tenders in the two trillion, government has got hundreds of state-owned enterprises, the likes of ESCOM, for example, which also create jobs for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in this country. And yet he said government does not create jobs and he's focusing that the private sector must create jobs. A private sector that he was a part of not so long ago and that I know that he's still involved in today. Cyril has sat on 18 boards at his peak. He's got a company called Shanduga, which is now supposedly in a blind trust, which is just bullshit wording for, it's not for public consumption, but it's still there in the background. He believes in business. He's tasted the meat of business and he doesn't want to let go. And what he's learned, if you've ever studied history, not just in South Africa, not just on the African continent, but everywhere. If you study history, power obviously is not just in the minds, but it's also in resource control. What Cyril understands is that if the ANC ever loses power, himself, his family, some of his funders and his friends will still run this country from an economic perspective. It happened with apartheid. Apartheid ended. However, we all know that the economy is still in minority hands. And those minority hands are the ones that fund the ANC, that capture government in effect, and that still get to run this country. So what Cyril and his friends are trying to do is to go back. Maybe it's something they decided under Codesa to say that we will make sure that uh, an ESCOM, an SAA, and other very key companies will go into private hands so that whoever's in government after we leave have no real power. All they'll be is a voice. Currently, our government doesn't have much power, but they sometimes get to set policies for some of these SOEs. But once those SOEs are gone, government has nothing. And this is not me fighting that government should have anything. It's me trying to explain what is currently happening in this country. What is ESCOM unable to do that the independent power producers will do? And why will the IPPs be funded by ESCOM and government? I'll speak about governments over 2 trillion rand, but in the same breath, the government also has the PIC, the Public Investment Corporation, which itself has 2 trillion rand, which is invested in largely big white businesses. It's a game of gangs. We saw with the Russian oligarchs. Um, I think before Vladimir Putin, it may have been Boris. I don't know if it was Boris Yeltsin or Boris who. Who also had his own crew of billionaires around him. That helped him run his state and he gave them big businesses there. We've seen the same happen in America under the Bush administration as an example. Joe Biden's son we know is in business, for example. We saw it in places like Japan. There was an industrial class there that set up businesses like Mitsubishi, Toyota, etc. And obviously in places like South Korea. It's something that happens the world over. South Africa is not unique. But you guys have lost it. And sadly, one of the things I've had to accept is that the masses, not just black people, not just in South Africa, but everywhere around the world, are just puppets and zombies. It's people that fundamentally cannot think for themselves because thinking is very, very difficult. Thinking is very, very difficult because after you've thought, you have to analyze, you have to see how things are, and then you're the person that's expected to come up with solutions. And then you have to implement the solutions and deal with the consequences. Thinking is hard. So most people outsource their thinking to politicians, to pastors and other religious leaders, to kings and chiefs and other traditional leaders, to big business, to the media, whether it's newspapers, whether it's the news on television, 
or even to social media and some of their celebrities. Most of those people that you outsource your thinking to are funded in one way or another by a very small elite that dictate what gets to flight on TV, that dictate what gets to be approved on social media before it gets censored or taken down. They get to decide that. They decide what is legal, what is illegal, what is moral, what is immoral. Is it immoral for an American government to go and bomb innocent people in Iran and Afghanistan? What does the Bible say about that? What does the Constitution say about that? All of a sudden, everyone turns a blind eye and we're all speaking a different tune because the right people are telling you that it's fine. The American government is still bombing countries like Somalia today. It's fine. And yet they will tell you that killing is wrong. It's illegal. It's immoral. It's in the Bible as a sin. Yet they, your leaders, are doing exactly that. We saw the bullying that happened under COVID-19 and the lockdown. And in that same bullying, some billionaires became extremely wealthy, wealthier than they ever were. Your own president and his family members became wealthy. The government that you vote for took some of the government money and it gave them to a private NPO, the Solidarity Fund, run by Cyril Ramaphosa's friends. Today we're speaking about Guazulu Natal's floods, where again government has given money to a private NPO. Because the same government doesn't trust government employees. It's own government employees. Why? Because they are not part of the right gang. When you look at the United Nations as potentially the biggest government in the world, it's run by gangs. The biggest bully in that gang is the United States of America. China is trying to claim a stake. Russia is trying to claim a stake, a stake as well. It's gangs. And some people, of course, because they're scared, they always want to be with the biggest bully in the gang. They want to side with an America or they want to side with the China. They're too scared to be on their own. There are people like Fili Mbalula in this country who sing with whoever's going to feed them. If it's Jacob Zuma, they'll sing with Jacob. If it's Cyril, they'll sing with Cyril. If tomorrow Titi Mabuza becomes president, you'll see Fili Mbalula changing his tune. Tito Mboweni has done the same. These people are just singing for their supper. They are dogs and puppets for hire. These are the people you call leaders that get to tell you how to act and think and react. And even they are given a script. They are actors. In America, they call them bad actors. Those are your leaders. Thinking is hard. Other gangs, of course, are the Radical Economic Transformation Gang, President Jacob Zuma, ex-president Jacob Zuma, and NTZ, and some of the other people that were benefiting under the Zuma administration. They want you to pick sides. You believe Cyril and his white monopoly capital gang are ethical because they do business in a more white, palatable way. They eat with a fork and knife. And you don't like the Jacob Zuma RET gang because they eat with their hands and it looks clumsy and it looks African and barbaric. But these are all gangs that don't care about you because business is war and all of them are trying to accumulate resources. You may see some of your community members benefiting, but that's only because they want to win your vote. The DA that services white neighborhoods and uppity black neighborhoods is just trying to win their votes. That's fundamentally what we have at play here. You obviously don't have a choice if you're scared, if, if thinking is difficult. You have to pick a gang. If you don't pick a gang, a gang will be picked for you by certain people. You might be the collateral damage. You might just find yourself in a march. You might find yourself being killed. You might find yourself being retrenched. You might find yourself under lockdown. You might find yourself being jabbed with certain medication that might make you sick or maybe even kill you. Cyril Ramaphosa doesn't care. And a lot of us who still keep trying to speak to him, whether it's in speeches, whether it's in the media via journalists, the guy doesn't care. The guy is soulless. Himself, his funders and other people at the top, they have no soul. All they care about is hoarding as much of the resources as possible, influencing as much of the media and other platforms as possible to control your minds and making sure that they're in power. They will say whatever you want to hear in a close setting. They will laugh and smile with you to, to disarm you, but they don't care. Your kings and your chiefs were handpicked because they are the right people to make sure that the land is still benefiting a minority of people and not the masses on that land. The, the religious leaders, the, the biggest ones that you know, are allowed to be there because they don't dismantle anything. They don't challenge the status quo. And when people like myself are trying to dismantle, recolonize, rewire, re-engineer other minds, we are called names by the same people, you guys, puppets and, zom and zombies that don't understand how the world works. But I will keep fighting. I know other people have fought in the past. Sheikh Guevara, Thomas Sankara, Marcus Garvey, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, you know, Steve Beagle here. 
These were people that were trying to save your mind. Unfortunately, they also had their own gangs. And they wanted you to join their gangs. And they were hoping that their gangs would benefit the masses. But the people that run the world, or the people that understand, at least understand that the people that run the world always have, don't care about the masses. Because all they see the masses as is food. And if not food, they just see you as tools that they can use so that they can amass wealth. And also to defend them and fight for them to protect their wealth. You're out here defending Cyril, Patrice, some of the white business people they work with like Brian Joffe, Stephen Sart, people like Johan Rupert, the Oppenheimers, who do very well to keep quiet in this country. You're defending them. On the other hand, there's people defending Jacob Zuma, defending Matsela Koko, defending Brian Molive, defending the Guptas. These people do nothing for you. They are just gangs at the top. And you're just the clowns at the bottom that are also their gatekeepers somewhere, somehow. I'm trying to build my own gang, penalism. It's my own religion. And it's me trying to fight the minds, for the minds of people. Because if I have your mind, it's going to be easy to maybe take your money and your resources. It's going to be easy to control your body. It's going to be easy to get you to behave in a certain way. Like the ZCC church, like the Shembe church, like the Muslim community, like the Jewish community, like people in North Korea or China who defend the gang that they come from. I am building my own gang. It's going to be a friendly gang. It's going to work, work with other people, but we will never be confused that business is war, land is fought for, people die for it, people kill for it, and that the mind is the ultimate battleground. And I'm trying to unplug as many minds as possible so that I can colonize them myself, so I can also be a player in this world. And we can also, along with my gang and the people that move with me, have our stake, have our money, have our land, have our way of being in this world. The gangs are not going to end. You can fight them, you can cry and scream and whatever, but this is what's happening. And I'm hoping that with my gang, at least wherever we are, we can show the community that we are a better gang than the rest and we're not trying to kill you. We're trying to uplift you. And even though we may use you as soldiers, as employees, as tools, we will make sure that you benefit as far as possible. We're not out here to just exploit you. We don't just see you as pieces of things. Pen you all the black pen. I think... This is a very important conversation and one that needs to keep going. Have a great day, man. Take care of yourself. Take care of your mind. Cheers.